Good afternoon, everybody. Thank you so much for um, joining us for this Institute of Mechanical Engineers uh, webinar. It's part of a series on the on, on sustainable systems that the institution of run, is, is running. And today we'll be looking at uh, life cycle analysis of renewable energy technologies and then diving into the recycling challenges or recyclable materials in wind turbine components. We're very fortunate to have uh, Dr. Jayo Yan and Professor Richard Cochran, who will be giving us the, um, the two uh, presentations. Hi, everybody. Uh, my name is Xiao Yu Yan. I'm an academic at the University of Exeter and a transport and mechanical engineer by training. My main area of research is to evaluate the effects of energy technologies and systems on the environment. And I'm really glad to have this opportunity to talk about an important topic, which is life cycle assessment of renewables. So here's what I hope to go through in the next 20 minutes or so. I will start with a brief introduction to the life cycle assessment method or LCA, which is a key tool to quantify environmental performance of any products or technologies. We then look at why there's a need to use LCA to evaluate the renewable energy technologies. I will present the state-of-the-art understanding of the environmental impacts of renewables from a life cycle point of view in comparison with fossil fuels. Um, I will also talk a little bit about responsible sourcing of raw materials, um, particularly critical metals such as rare earths, because I think this is really key to making renewables sustainable or certainly more sustainable. And finally, I will summarize some take-home messages. We, we all know that we need to tackle the enormous environmental challenges facing humanity today. But in order to do so, we need a way to quantify and compare the sustainability of different actions we take every day as individuals, organizations, and society as a whole. For example, companies might need to know which types of material is best for their products, or we as individual consumers uh, might want to know the environmental impacts of things that we buy. At the society level, we need to know the best ways to deal with waste and generate energy. So we really need a um, consistent and reliable method to do this. And this is where LCA comes in. It's a standardized tool to quantify the inputs such as resources and outputs such as waste and emissions of any product systems over their entire life cycle. From the extraction of raw materials to the manufacturing through to the end of life and also assess the environmental impacts associated with these inputs and outputs. And this gives us a holistic view of the overall impacts of any defined system and therefore can help avoid problem shifting from one life cycle stage to another or one place to another. And in the ISO standards for LCA, there are four main steps, uh, go and scope definition, inventory analysis, impact assessment, and interpretation, which sort of runs in parallel with the other three steps. Now, I will go briefly go through how you go about doing this so that you understand uh, what I'm talking about when I say life cycle impacts of renewables. So the first thing of an LCA study is to define its goal and scope. You need to clearly state the aim of the study, which usually relates to a central question you want to answer. For example, whether a product is better than another. And describe the system you want to assess, especially if it's a new technology or new product. You then need to define the so-called functional unit, which is a quantitative measure of the main function of the product system, and that provides a reference to which all the inputs and outputs of the system can be related, as well as a basis 
on which comparisons between different products and technologies can be made. And finally, you need to define the system boundary, which defines what technological and economic processes need to be included in your LCA and state which impact categories are of concern because there are quite a lot of impacts that we can look at. And also these will determine which impact assessment method needs to be used later. The second step is life cycle inventory analysis or LCI. The aim of this stage is to quantify and compile all the physical inputs, such as uh, different resources required to a given product system, and the outputs, such as different, uh, different products, emissions, and waste generated from the same product system. Now, this is usually the most labor-intensive and time-consuming stage, as there's a lot of number crunching needed. So essentially, you're building a, a very big matrix of inputs and outputs, as shown on this slide. And the third step is called Lifecycle Impact Assessment, or LCIA. The LCIA phase is the evaluation of potential environmental impacts of the resources uses and the environmental releases identified and quantified in the inventory stage. Here we need to use the so-called impact assessment factors or impact characterization factors to turn the inventory of resource use and emissions into different environmental impacts, including, for example, climate change, land use, water pollution, etc. And these Characterization factors are usually derived from modeling the environmental mechanisms of a particular impact pathway based on our understanding of the complex system of physical, chemical, and biological processes involved. And there are many different LCIA methods to choose from. Um, so which one or ones needs to be used in a particular study depend on the impact categories of concern. And the last step of LCA is interpretation. And this is a systematic technique to identify, quantify, check, and evaluate information from the results of the inventory analysis and impact assessment, and also communicate them effectively. So basically, we calculated all these numbers, so what? What do they mean? Completing these four steps means that you will have done an ISO compliant LCA study. Now, you might wonder why do we need to do an LCA to assess renewable energy technologies such as wind turbines? Surely they have zero or minimal impacts. Well, it is true that during operation they are pretty clean, uh, they don't emit anything, but um, over their entire life cycle, from mining the minerals and ores. Uh, through to the raw material production, such as steel, glass reinforced complex, uh, uh, carbon fiber, components, manufacturing, transportation, installation, maintenance and repair, and finally decommissioning and disposal. Every step of their life cycle will involve use of some sort of resources, such as energy and water, and generate some waste and emissions, such as CO2. So they're not really zero emission or zero impact. It's just that most of their impacts do not happen at the operational stage. And this is why we need a good understanding of their impacts in comparison with other energy technologies, such as fossil fuels. So if we look at the life cycle of electricity generated from fossil fuels, such as coal, now, this is relatively straightforward. You need to mine, again, the raw materials for your coal power plant, and then you build the plant. You also need to mine and transport the coal to the power plant. And then it's the operation of the power plant, i.e. burning the coal to generate electricity. And of course, finally, the decommissioning of the power plants and then the uh, demolition waste being either recycled or disposed of. So we need to use LCA to evaluate all the energy technologies 
to fully understand their impact so that we can choose the ones with the best environmental performance in order to move towards a sustainable energy system in the long run. So now let's look at some results from um, some of the best LCA studies uh, comparing electricity generated from fossil fuels and renewables. Now in the interest of time, we will focus on just a few key impacts only. Um, this global scale study shown on this graph um, found that the life cycle greenhouse gas emissions, uh, also widely known as carbon footprint, of electricity generated from fossil fuels are much higher than that from renewables, as you can see there. Uh, so for example, depending on the technology used, coal power has a carbon footprint of uh, 800 to 1,000 kilograms of CO2 equivalent per megawatt hour. Natural gas power is about half that uh, at 500. If carbon capture and storage is used, this can potentially be reduced to about two to 300. In comparison, pretty much all renewable energy technologies uh, on the left-hand side uh, considered in this study, including Solar, pho solar photovoltaics, concentrating solar power, hydropower, and wind power are below 100 uh, kilograms of CO2 equivalent per megawatt hour. And of course, as you can see, the only exception is hydropower. Um, and this is mainly because the creation of uh, reservoirs, particularly big reservoirs, can generate uh, greenhouse gas emissions. So when a large area needs to be flooded to create a big reservoir, what happens is that the vegetation above ground uh, and the soil organic matter below ground will gradually decompose and release significant amounts of CO2 and methane, which is, of course, a powerful uh, greenhouse gas. If we look at land occupation, which is a key driver for ecological impacts and biodiversity impacts, the same study found a very mixed picture. So first of all, there's a big difference between coal and natural gas, mainly because the nature of these fossil fuels um, and the methods used to mine or extract them. For example, if open pit mining is used, uh, then the production of coal can occupy uh, a very uh, large land surface indeed. The renewables vary significantly from minimal land use by wind power to uh, significant land use uh, of hydropower. And sometimes hydropower can even have higher land occupation than coal, as shown on the figure. And again, this is because of big reservoirs. Um, but for solar power, uh, land occupation can also be very high if they are ground-mounted systems, uh, such as ones shown on the photo on the left. Another impact is uh, demand for metals that are heavily used in energy systems, such as copper. You can see that on a per energy output basis, um, PV, uh, photovoltaic, and in fact, most renewables, except uh, hydro, have much higher demand for copper than fossil fuels. And this is mainly because of uh, more inverters and transformers are needed for, for these technologies. While demand for metals is not an environmental impact per se, but the mining and processing of these metals are usually very energy and therefore carbon intensive and they can also cause pollution of water and land. So we really need to have a good handle on this. And I will come back to this point later. Finally, water consumption uh, is another key impact we need to understand because water is an essential uh, resources for humanity that is getting increasingly stressed because of climate change and pollution. So energy is actually a very thirsty industry. And on the left, you can see that any kind of uh, thermal electricity generation technologies, including renewables, such as uh, concentrating solar power and geothermal, as well as uh, fossil fuels and nuclear, um, can have a very high water footprint 
primarily during the operational stage um, because water is used as a medium to transport heat um, as shown uh, in uh, by the green bit on the figure. And in comparison, PV and wind generally have very low water requirements, especially wind. From the figure on the right, you can see that hydropower uh, dwarfs everything else. And that's again mainly because of huge uh, evaporation loss from reservoirs. So understanding these water impacts are critical, particularly for any area that's arid and has limited water resources. Another point I want to make is that the environmental performance of renewables is not just down to the technologies themselves. How we apply them uh, can also matter. So this is an LCA we did on a seemingly promising uh, renewable technology, vertical access wind turbines. Now these turbines are generally much smaller than the horizontal access turbines and do not have long sharp blades. So they can be installed in many, many more places, uh, including urban areas or even on top of buildings. So in this study, we assessed the impacts of this particular turbine technology installed at a university campus in Poland using actual performance data monitored over three years. Now, what we found was um, pretty shocking, actually. Um, the impacts of electricity generated from this turbine, the uh, gray, gray bars, were much worse than the electricity on the Polish grid, which is dominated by coal power, uh, shown on the, on the graph as the blue bars. So the gray bars are the uh, impacts of electricity generated from this turbine, and the blue bars are the Polish grid electricity, which is dominated by coal power. And the reason for this very poor performance of the two, sorry, the reason for this uh, is the very poor performance of the turbine at this site, where it only achieved a capacity factor of 0.5% due to the uh, low wind speed. And the average capacity factor for vertical access turbines we found in the literature was 9%. And if we use this number, the 9% figure, um, i.e. put the turbine at a site that has much better wind speed, its impact would reduce drastically. As you can see from the orange bars, um, they're now uh, lower than the blue bars. Now, this is not difficult to understand as the embedded impacts for the turbine are fixed. So more electricity can generate over its lifetime, the lower the impact per energy uh, output. But you can notice that uh, even then, there's one particular uh, impact category called abiotic depletion, where the turbine is still worse than coal power even if we use a 9% capacity factor. And this is basically due to the higher demand for minerals and metals for renewables compared with fossil fuels, as I mentioned earlier. So this leads to my last topic, uh, sourcing of critical raw materials for low carbon energy technologies, uh, which is really key to our ability to reach net zero in my view. Now, clean energy is an area experiencing exponential growth in terms of innovation, and there are so many new technologies emerging these days. But I think we need to be extremely careful because many clean energy tech can potentially have higher impacts than the conventional energy that they aim to replace from a whole life cycle point of view. Now, the reason for this, or certainly a significant part of the reason for this, is clean energy tech in general uses more types and larger quantities of raw materials than conventional energy, leading to a rapidly increasing demand for a wide range of metals. And yet, the impacts of extracting, processing, and potentially recycling of many of these metals, particularly the critical ones such as rare earths, lithium, cobalt, are still poorly understood. Now the energy and the mining industries are of course catching up with this issue because the consumers and policymakers are now much more aware of these 
upstream impacts than before. And of course, there's uh, a lot of media attention and also academic debates going on regarding the sustainability of many renewable technologies, low carbon uh, uh, technologies such as electric vehicles and hydrogen. And this is why we need to make sure the raw materials that we use in these clean technologies, particularly the most impactful ones, such as rare earths, are produced environmentally responsibly. And we've done quite a lot of work helping mining companies to understand and improve their environmental performance. For example, a former PhD student of mine used LCA to assess the impacts of rare earth elements. Uh, what's shown here is an example. And during his PhD, he developed a number of modeling techniques, metrics, and data sets specific for minerals and metals, which turned out to be quite valuable. And in fact, there was so much demand for these tools and data uh, from the mining industry, but also the investors community, that he decided to set up a spin-out company called MinViral to commercialize the IP. And we've successfully secured private investment and Innovate UK funding to scale up consultancy activities and further develop our proprietary software tools and databases. Over the last year alone, we've already worked with more than a dozen mining companies to help them improve the environmental performance of a wide range of minerals and metals for clean tech, such as lithium, cobalt, nickel, magnesium, graphite, um, in addition to rare earths, all of which are, of course, important in low carbon energy technologies. And I'm also involved in a few research projects to develop more environmentally friendly ways for exploration, production, and recycling of these critical technology metals. And we believe this is absolute key to us achieving net zero, as the potential cumulative impacts of a significant increase in mining activities driven by clean energy adoption have so far been overlooked. Finally, um, a quick sort of summary of what we talked about. Uh, LCA is really a useful tool for assessing the environmental impacts of any products and technologies. Existing LCAs on electricity generation show that renewables generally have much lower environmental impacts, carbon footprints in particular, than fossil fuels. But there are impacts where renewables can perform worse, such as land occupation, and there are impacts that are not well understood, particularly ones related to critical metal production. And given that many new technologies are emerging in the renewable or low carbon energy space, we need to use LCA to understand their potential environmental implications in order to make sure that they are truly sustainable in the long run. And that's the end of my talk. Thank you very much for your attention, and I'm happy to answer any questions you might have. Thank you. <clears throat> Thank you, Chayu, for that. That was, I think, uh, I'm sure we'll all agree, an excellent presentation on, on a really important topic that is only, only going to become more important as we go forward and uh, it's good to see that there's some some really i think useful work going on there <clears throat> at the university of exeter in the um environment and sustainability and sustainability institute where um where Shayu, uh, works we also have um now a uh a lecture from professor richard cochran just before that i'll just add in that there is the opportunity if you have questions you can type them into the ask a question chat bar and we'll do our best to um, come on to those and have some time for discussion at the end. I'll now hand over to uh, Professor Richard Cochran, who lectures also at the uh, University of Exeter uh, and uh, the campus in uh, beautiful Cornwall. And Richard will talk to us about uh, recyclable materials for wind turbines. Great, good afternoon, everybody. I hope you can all hear me okay. Um, so thank you for talking about you. As I said, 
my name is Professor Richard Cochrane. I work with the Renewable Energy Group based to the University of Exeter down in Cornwall. We've got a team working on offshore renewables, looking at a wave and tidal power, and actually recently increasingly work on offshore wind and particularly floating offshore wind as the sort of next development in that sector. We've got a group working on the latest solar technology, the next generation of solar panels, and then supporting work, Zhao Yu on the life cycle analysis, colleagues who work on the connections of renewable energy systems to the grid, or the connection of energy storage to the grid, as well as work on energy storage technologies and the policy framework that renewable energy is deployed within. Personally, for me, my background is was starting off in general engineering, but developed a passion for innovative solutions that will help and protect the environment. So we've worked on energy in buildings, looking at energy efficiency, but also integration of renewables, uh, developed products like the solar tiles to try and facilitate easy installation of um, solar with existing building stock, we've developed a vertical axis wind turbine, the helical form to work in turbulent wind environments, and I've worked on hydropower and other technologies like that. In terms of wind, the focus today, I have really been, I suppose, very impressed with the progress that we've made in the wind energy sector. Very exciting that the sector is now cost effective. We always used to have to push, we were pushing for renewables, but had to fight for subsidies or other financial support because it was more expensive. But in about 2015, onshore wind became cost effective without any subsidy. It's cheaper to make electricity from, from wind than it is from fossil fuel technology, which has been a very exciting uh, crossover point on that. Now the technology really has come on. Externally, perhaps a modern turbine looks rather similar to technologies that were put up 20 years ago, but they perform so much better. We recently visited Good Hilly Wind Farm, the second farm wind farm that was developed in the UK. And on that site used to have 14 turbines and it was repowered with six modern units. Now those six turbines generate three times as much energy as the 14 old ones used to. And as well as that, they are considerably quieter because they're larger, they turn more slowly. So I think they're rather more graceful. Uh, there is a challenge that they can be seen from much further because they are taller. So you can see them from further apart, but actually local residents were concerned about that repowering, these big machines coming in, but actually now they're in, they see how much better they perform, how much quieter they are, how much graceful they are, and they delighted with them. They basically make that area carbon neutral from the energy that's involved in them. So onshore wind has been very exciting in those sorts of developments. And increasingly we're seeing real progress uh, in the offshore wind sector. Uh, a little while ago, there was the government plans to highlight that we're gonna deliver about 40 gigawatts by 2030 of combined onshore and offshore wind. And like onshore wind, again, very exciting that offshore wind is now viable effectively without subsidy. It's still supported by the CFD contracts for difference, but um, they agreed a price which is effectively lower than the pool price of electricity. So in effect, wind, offshore wind is now viable without a subsidy going forward. So we've seen good steady growth in the wind, wind sector and um, there is still onshore wind being deployed in perhaps less in England but more in Scotland, Wales due to planning arrangements but particularly the growth we're seeing is the offshore wind sector. Now what does that do overall? These are the sort of latest figures from Renewable UK who support the industry and highlight the sort of 24 gigawatts of total installed capacity that we have. And I quite like the figure that actually those turbines generate as much electricity every year 
as is consumed by 18 and a half million homes. It's a really quite a good contribution to our energy network. And it's, I've been very impressed with how that's worked to decarbonize the electricity that we generate. Six years ago, typical values, eight years ago perhaps, the carbon intensity of our grid was over 500 grams emitted for every kilowatt hour consumed in electricity. And typically now that's about 200. I just looked at the figures, you can, it's all available on the web. And today it's about 230. And a quarter of our power today is coming from wind energy in the UK. So that growth is forecast to continue. Um, and you can see the blue lines here, onshore and offshore wind, both forecast to considerably grow and an increasing contribution to our energy performance going forward. But we are finding from that, particularly the early deployment, that the first generation of turbines are coming to the end of their nominal design life. And the industry is working hard to work out what to do with them. Now, to put some context around, I think the blades are the, the area of focus that we'll, we'll explore further. But overall, actually, the majority of the mass of a wind turbine can be relatively easily recycled. The bulk of the weight of a turbine is the tower, the structure around the nacelle, the gearbox, the generator, and those metal steel components can be recycled quite easily. Um, 85 to 90% of the total mass can already be recycled quite easily. But we are looking at potentially still 25,000 tonnes of blades that will reach the end of their nominal life within the next few years. Now, these blades have been designed for, for longevity to be out in the environment for years, decades, and they work very well. But when they were designed, recycling was not, unfortunately, the priority with the design life. They were designed to with materials available at the time. And um, that's, yeah, they are hard to, to recycle. Now, industry fully recognizes this the challenges of the waste of all these blades and are keen to avoid them going into to landfill, uh, are looking at ways to increase the recyclability of blades in the future, looking at the sort of full circular economy, understanding the whole life cycle of the blades and what can be done with those materials at the end of their life. So it is an issue what, what's going to happen with these materials. Um, and there have been cases where, like this image here, blades have been, because there wasn't a process available at the time, chucked into landfill, which is really not an appropriate solution for this. If they are simply being disposed of, there are technologies that are being explored that could be far better in terms of the energy consumption. One of those is pyrolysis of the blades, um, which is a route to recover some of the material involved in the blades. So this is almost like melting the blade, super high temperature, but with very limited oxygen supply to, and it breaks down the components relatively effectively. Uh, it is possible to recover some of the fiber, the glass fiber and things from the blade materials, which could be reused. And then the pyrolysis oil that comes off um, has a variety of options that it could be used for in terms of plastic manufacture or other things like that. It could be burnt, but then that's releasing carbon dioxide into the atmosphere, which is what we're trying to avoid in a sense. So it isn't, in a way, quite straightforward what to do with the blades externally, a white lump of plastic, but actually internally, really quite involved 
composite structures. They work and have a phenomenal loading on them from the wind. And you have a, the sort of box section illustrated here. Typically, it has carbon fiber on the shear web top and bottom surfaces. And that's what sort of minimize the more expensive carbon fiber, just where it's doing the most work structurally. But the other parts of the blade to create the airfoil shape are often glass fiber. And then there's various filler and other components in there. So it isn't a simple um, sort of individual bit of glass fiber. There's quite, it's quite a complex structure. You've got other elements in it, like a lightning conductor and those parameters, which also need to be separated. And we have made really phenomenal progress in actually the manufacturing of these blades. Some of the latest ones, 107 meters long, and developments of things like vacuum and resin infusion, where rather than making the blade out of lots of different components and then gluing them all together, some of these latest blades are manufactured in a single process where the internal structure is supported and then dry fibers laid up into all of that molds and then resin infusion sucks through an epoxy resin through the whole 107 meter long blades, which has been fantastic in terms of their performance because they're all effectively fused in one process. They're far stronger and far lighter, which is very important for the weight loading as these blades spin round. It increases their longevity, makes them far more robust and far cheaper to manufacture relative to their size. And I suppose just to put the sort of context that said the industry is also looking at other, uh, collaborating with other sectors and wind energy is a significant proportion of the composite market, but only just under a quarter of it overall. So the aerospace sector, um, marine sector, construction, all those other areas uh, are also using composites and also need to address opportunities for recyclability of these materials going forward. So I've borrowed a few slides from a colleague who's been looking at this area, but particularly focused on tidal technology. So thank you, Stuart Walker, for these images, um, summarizing some of the work for this, the Tiger project, looking at tidal in, innovations in tidal energy. Um, it highlights again those the number of blades that are coming through and what can be done to address those. So as Yao Yu hi highlighted, it's very important to consider the full life cycle analysis of this and not just focus on the um, performance and energy optimization at this stage. I, overall, I've been very impressed. I think a large wind turbine does use energy in its manufacturer, but it generates so much energy once it's in operation that within six to nine months, it has saved as much energy as was used in the construction of that solar uh, of the wind turbine, which I think yeah, very impressive, shows remarkable efficiency of the modern units going forward. So if we look at the that full process, again, as I highlighted, very important to consider the full operational life, what happens at the end of life, and then whether that is, unfortunately, some of them being incinerated, some of them going to landfill, or opportunities to recycle and separate those materials going forward. So we do have different materials within that, those structures, the steel relatively easy, but the real challenge is a lot of the composite materials that we're working with. And there is real progress in some of these areas. At the moment, a lot of the blades were made with a resin that isn't possible easily to separate from the carbon or glass fibers. 
but there are companies developing a recyclable epoxy. Um, we did some work to analyze this, thinking, well, what's the, going to be the compromise? This new material isn't going to perform as well. So the material is going to be weaker. The blades are therefore going to be heavier. And actually, through all that analysis, we found that the blade performance was just as good as the existing epoxy resins and enabled performance with the same strength and weight performance going forward. So again, important to look at the whole life cycle of carbon emissions related to those different components. And there are opportunities, particularly in other sectors where um, and in some areas, things like bio-based composites could be very attractive. Perhaps a challenge for the hard work that the blade structure needs to do, but various other components, the nose cone, the nacelle housing, all those bits perhaps could be make use of these bio-based composite materials going forward. And different sectors with different loading, that might be possible. So we've got opportunities to, to separate some of those components, but some very nice examples of what else could be done with those components. So although we don't have the confidence to keep these blades operating, although actually having said that, a lot of the turbines that were repowered, um, the materials have been sold and have been repurposed. They check the longevity, the fatigue cycles weren't as onerous as initially assumed and they've gone on to be repurposed, repowered elsewhere. But some nice examples of where the structure is still intact enough to form a, a bicycle shelter, like these ones in Holland or Denmark, sorry. Um, great opportunity there. Then some very nice examples of, in this case, a child's play area. Great fun. I think I've seen some very nice examples here where the kids can crawl through the tunnel go up and slide down the slide and other examples where they've been turned into a climbing wall um, so a nice again further purpose of that and then innovation in terms of in this case a seating turn it into a seat and other opportunities like that then in other ways there are other opportunities so this company are proposing almost sort of grinding up the the blades and then creating pellets which are then fused into other building materials. So it repurposes the fiber reinforcement mostly for their proposals into construction materials. So they're making uh, construction panels for buildings that give that the blade life a second life going forward. So thank you very much for that. I now welcome any any questions on any of those subjects. Thank you. Hi everyone, it's Fiona from the iMechi. Um, David is just experiencing some uh, microphone issues, so please bear with us for a few minutes and he'll be back shortly with the Q&A. Thank you. Okay. Oh, sorry, I guess there's still issues with some of the, the connections. Um, but I'll just try and pick up some of those questions. We're just looking at the list. Steve Rogers asked, what's the typical lifespan of turbine blades? So they tend to be designed for um, at least 20, 25 years, but that's based on certain wind characteristics. And as I said, quite often the, there is opportunity to repurpose those blades. And a lot of the turbines were repowered have been reused elsewhere. So Kaya Pandya has asked, do we know the recycling rate of wind turbine generators or other components? So I think yeah, generally those bits have been recycled very effectively. 
the metal components are far easier to process, separate out the copper from the steel, and then they can be recycled very well. So good rate recycling rates on those components and the steel tower and other things like that. Edward Cooper asked uh, how wind turbine blades are used in a tidal energy system. And well, there are diff quite different design drivers there. Um, so it, it, they often use similar composite materials, but the loading really is quite different. And there are different design challenges where it isn't particularly the weight of the blade that's an issue, uh, but things like the pressure variation if the blade goes up and then goes down through the water cycle, it's getting quite a lot of compression force. So often they're made far stronger, thicker wool, that sort of thing, to reduce that pressure difference as opposed to a wind turbine blade, which you're trying to minimize the weight very effectively. Uh, but certainly lessons learned and ways that we can help and work together on that. Ruth has asked what's the, the cost difference between non recyclable and recyclable epoxy resin. That is the challenge, I think, at the moment is the volume of manufacture. The, uh, at the moment, those recyclable resins are novel and only produced in relatively small quantities, so they are rather more expensive at the moment, but hopefully that will change in time going forward. Industry certainly seems to be going for that going forward. Great. Thank you. Um, thank, thank you, Richard, for, for taking over there. I, I do apologize. I, I seem to have uh, dropped off the um, dropped off the, the line there and, and have just, just come back in. So um, many, many apologies for, for that. And, and, and Richard, thank you so much for, for jumping in. Um, I, I just maybe wanted to um, pick up on, uh, on, on on one question that has come in. So I think particularly relevant going going forward to, to COP26. So one, one question here, and I'll come to both of, both of you on this. So do you, do you have any thoughts on how governments should act now? Now and, and how much is needed to offset our impact? Perhaps, perhaps Richard, I could come come to you specifically thinking in terms of the wind industry, industry, what you might be looking for. I mean, again, I think that the support has been great, the push, for, particularly for offshore, but um, there's still lots of opportunities for onshore wind that are at the moment still more cost effective than than offshore. But that gap is closing quite impressively. Um, a lot of that is related to planning rather than the energy technology going forward. But yeah, support for R&D into developments like these recyclable epoxies, those sort of things would be great to see supported. Yeah. Okay. That, that that's really that's really helpful. Thank you for your for your thoughts, Matt. And um, Shayu, perhaps just in terms of uh, specifically in terms of life life cycle analysis, is there anything that you would be looking for? You think that governments should do that that could help us? Um, yeah, it's, it's a difficult question to answer because you can't do LCA on obviously everything. Um, but I guess the the key kind of uh, thing I, I want not just the government but but everyone every one of us to think about is that we don't just look at uh, the apparent uh, kind of impacts that's most visible essentially because we have to look at the whole life cycle. And that means that the, the most, to me, that the most effective way of reducing life cycle impacts is actually reducing the consumption in the first place. Um, because if we just keep um, supply uh, high using new technologies such as, you know, electric vehicles, etc., yes, they're better than the conventional. Uh, petrol and diesel cars, but over the life cycle, they still have quite significant impacts. So what we should do is to try and reduce the demand for the cars, the driving uh, in the first place, and the same goes for electricity as well, right? So the first thing is to, to reduce the demand for electricity, and then we look at supply uh, the rest with renewables. Does that does that answer answer that question? 
Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, no, that's really helpful. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, Richard, I just have another question for you, um, if that's OK. Um, so there was just a question here in terms of, I think you may have partially answered this, but what's the lifetime uh, typically for the, maybe for the new um, blades? And what would be the most determining factors in t for blade t deterioration in terms of fatigue or, or corrosion or whatever the other major factors might be? Yeah, so yes, it is designed for 25 year life, but as I said, some are being extended because they realize that they are more robust than they perhaps were designed to be. Um, fatigue is the main driver in that. The fatigue cycles, blade pulling one way, rotates around, pulls the other way, pulls up, pulls around, as well as the wind stopping and starting and those forces changing. So fatigue's the main driver. Other factors have influenced it. So erosion, particularly in a sort of dusty environment, can take away the uh, sort of gel coat, the outer layer of the um, that's protecting the blade and if water gets in that could damage things in a different way but it, yeah generally fatigue and those sort of life cycle is the main driver for that right okay thank you um and i i, I just one other question that's i guess come up maybe just related to, to wind in terms of the the life cycle cost of the wind turbine um is it sort of the build of your installation or the operation which is the sort of greatest driver perhaps i guess you're thinking most, mostly of the co2 emissions i don't know if either of you would be able to to answer that question i think yeah in terms of co2 the there is a lot of energy involved in the manufacture and the assembly but that is repaid within sort of six to nine months of the latest turbine developments. So quite impressive where they repay all that energy involved on an energy point of view. Um, Cost-wise, both, both are important. So understanding the operational um, aspects as well as the design work, both are important. But a lot of the cost is, or the, yeah, uh, no, so both are very relevant. A lot of the improvements that we've made, particularly in offshore wind, has come from reducing the operational cost, making the turbines more reliable so they have to be serviced, maintained less, and getting better at predicting when we need to go out and service that turbine, those sort of things, uh, has made the biggest difference, I think, in the, the cost, particularly for offshore wind. Perfect. Thank you. Thank you so much. Uh, thank you so much for that, Richard. We know that I know that you have to um, dash off to uh, to a lecture now. So um, I'll 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 give a few more questions to show you. But before you leave, Richard, just from from my myself and from the Institute of Mechanical Engineers, many thanks for for your for your time and for this uh, for the lecture today. Thank you, Richard. No problem. Thank you. It's been a pleasure. And if there are other questions, my email address was on the slide. So very happy to pick things up on the email if there are further questions that people want to ask. Perfect. Thank, thank you so much. Um, Jay, I think you can stay with us for another couple of minutes. So um, I did have a couple of LCA specific questions, which I just wanted to go through. One one of the first ones that came in was, um, so our life cycle analysis, or is that mandatory? Is that required um, by government? Or, uh, or is that a sort of at the moment, is that an optional thing from manufacturers? <laughs> Um, yeah, that's uh, actually mostly um, optional or voluntary thing at the moment. But for certain sectors, um, there are policies or regulations that require an LCA um, uh, is done. So, for example, in the um, renewable fuels for transport uh, sector, I believe that you have to... Uh, show that the the type of fuel that you supply on the market have to meet a certain uh, life cycle carbon footprint threshold, particularly for things like biofuels, for example, um, because some of the biofuels can be quite high carbon and, and it could be even more carbon intensive than the petrol and diesel that they reply, uh, sorry, they, they replace. So you have to show that um, the, the you know the biofuels that you you supply on the market have to hit a certain life cycle uh, carbon footprint threshold. But apart from that, in terms of the energy industry, that's the only the only one that I'm aware of. So mostly it will be uh, voluntary, really. <laughs> 
Right. Okay. No, understood that. I think that answers the question. And then another one, if you, I don't know if you could perhaps just briefly answer this as we're a bit, a bit closed on time. But so in terms of comparing um, small scale solar PV, so domestic, uh, maybe a solar panel on, on, on someone's roof versus a sort of commercial um, installation, is there a significant difference? Um, and as a generalization of the LPA of, of commercial versus domestic solar installations for solar PV? Yeah, that, that's a good question. Usually, it's difficult to say. It's, it's not a clear-cut comparison um, because it will depend on uh, where where each of these um, systems are, are placed. Obviously, as I mentioned earlier, the more electricity it generates, usually um, the impacts per, per unit electricity output would be lower. So if you imagine a... a a big solar farm down here in Cornwall uh, would generate a lot more energy uh, than a, um, a similar amount of panels uh, installed on roofs up in Scotland, right? It's just because, uh, you know, down here in Cornwall, we have more solar radiation. And that usually means that the, um, the impact per energy produced would be lower. Um, because these turbines are, sorry, these uh, panels are uh, usually quite similar in terms of embedded or, or um, fixed uh, sort of impacts. So the more energy it generates over its lifetime, the lower the impact. Perfect. Well, thank you so much. Um, thank you for answering those questions, uh, Shall you? And, and thank you for taking the time to to yeah to give us this this lecture today. Um, we've already said thanks to to Richard. So thanks to um, uh, Fiona in the background who's been uh, driving the slides for us, and thank you to the Institute of Mechanical Engineers for hosting. And most of all, thank you to all the listeners. Sorry that we weren't able to get through all the questions. Sorry also that we had this um, small audio kick up earlier on. But thank you very much for your time. We really hope this has been useful for you and uh, wish you a good afternoon. Thank you and goodbye. Thanks, David.